wondrous creator, we come to you this blessed, resurrecting morning with hearts amazed <coughs> we are love so much. We come to our sacred spaces to worship and celebrate the risen one. And with the same prayer that you once again let the words of my mouth and the resurrected meditations of our collective hearts simply be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, strengthen our Redeemer. Amen. So when you asked this week, I chose these two scriptures, including the one from Acts, to go together this week. Because in the reading, they seem to be in conversation with one another. And with the current state of our world, our country, and our community, there seems to be, well, a conversation happening. So shall we? Acts is the text that speaks to the how of living out the gospel. When people ask me for specifics on what Jesus is asking, they just don't understand how they are to follow the Jesus that they feel within them is beckoning or calling. I direct them to Acts. I invite them to listen to Luke's words that say this. Now the whole group of those who believed were one of heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. When we look at the impact of even our little free pantry this morning, or our visioning for a future, or even our logo. These are the verses I think of when we're deciding, do we want to take on another night in feeding the hungry? These are the verses I think of. As we proceed to John's Gospel today, let's take a little bit of a look at this scripture. So let's remember that it is the second week of what's called Eastertide. There are seven such weeks. Poetically, it reminds us that there's one more than the six weeks of Lent. So we get to celebrate one more than we grieve, right? Our primary guide for the season is the Gospel of John with a supporting Gospel role. This week and next are stories of the risen Jesus appearing to his followers. And the following four explore Jesus' teaching about faith, but ultimately intimacy with God. So a dear friend made this post on another social media platform. Warning, this is a candid post. But I hope you'll comment, he writes, even if you don't like it, or if I don't speak to your heart. I love all the postings of spring and feasting and family and friends. I had a lovely day myself with dear friends on a gorgeous spring day. But Easter, as a Christian holly and holy day, I experience is deeply depressing. I perceive my reaction as structured into the way that churches celebrate it. The rhythm of Holy Week creates a sense of foreboding, a growing darkness that ends in a day of death. As a child, I was taken to Good Friday services that started at noon and lasted three hours. A different preacher took each of the seven last words. We sat in dim light and sang mournful hymns. Jesus was dead for those three hours. Then less than 48 hours later comes a wild mood swing with the advent of an impossible and implausible hope. The women at the tomb realize they've seen their Lord, as do the men, albeit much later. He is risen, 
and we sing hymns indicating such. Before the condolence cards have even arrived, before I'm even on my second box of tissues, we're supposed to celebrate life again. This is so incomprehensible that Christians have widely adopted the pagan traditions of celebrating the fertility of life. That's that egg that we've talked about, right? Bunnies, eggs, flowers, and food. All the food. Far more people show up for the spring festival than attend Friday's funeral. Because who really wants to immerse themselves in such a manic, depressive episode? In American dominant culture, commercial culture that is, we most certainly don't want to face death. And we do everything possible to gloss it over, pretty it up, keep it out of sight. Easter plays right into this by plugging up the broken dam of grief before it even starts. Jesus didn't pass away cross to the other side, or immediately become undead and hang from the heavens above to simply be with us. We just can't see him. No, he died. Like our loved ones, people whose lives have been intertwined with ours, he's dead. Like those children. A poet expresses this so well. This marble fact, they're not coming back. The resurrection is a preposterous and useless myth if this is not a marble fact. He died. I know that we say Thomas was a doubter. In fact, Jesus does too, right? I want to say I too was a doubter. I doubted that I too would find some resolution to my own story. And friends, it isn't tied up in a neat bow. But there is hope within it. As some of you may know, and the wounds, they are still there. But there is healing to be had. This is still my friend. I'm like Thomas and like Mary, depending on the day. Listen to John's gospel. Have you believed because you have seen me? Jesus asks Thomas. And by extension, he's asking the whole group. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe in John 20, 29. The disciples themselves refuse to believe on the basis of testimony alone. But a new chapter is now beginning in this salvation history, a chapter in which the movement will grow and the church is born, all on the basis of testimony. And it begins with women's testimony. Indeed, what's really going on in the story is that Jesus is continuing the departure that he began in Jerusalem. He breathes the Holy Spirit upon his followers and commissions them, sending them out to announce the good news, to persuade on the basis of testimony, of hearing, but not seeing. It's as if Jesus says, I understand your need to see, and to touch my body, my wounds, in order to believe. And I will bind us together by allowing you to touch my wounds, my side. But there's an even deeper form of faith and trust, an even higher gear of understanding that isn't dependent on signs and wonders and miracles, or even on the presence of this physical body, but rather has ears and eyes to discern me within you and throughout creation. And I, this is Jesus, call you and commission you. He's talking to the disciples, but he's also talking to us, these later disciples, these later apostles, and commission you them, but also us, toward that deeper faith, that higher understanding, which isn't in touching wounds and reaching into sides, that deeper faith, that higher understanding, that resides in here and in here. And we've talked about that a little bit in our Mary group, right? That soul understanding. 
understanding. And now I give you, he gives us, the Holy Spirit and sends you, us, out, away from a physical body into an even deeper, blessed intimacy with me, not me, Jesus. And even in his resurrection, the sign of all signs isn't the end of a road for you, which is us, right? It's them and us. With the Spirit's help, we get to go and climb still higher. There's a more blessed faith beyond these signs and wonders. 5,000 people were fed. 5,000 men, so who knows how many were fed, right, with the miracles. And if we wonder how many people have been fed by all these little free pantries that have spread up all over this metro area, do we wonder how many folks have been fed with cans of peaches and baby formula and diapers and socks and mittens in the winter, right? I can imagine more than 5,000 folks have been touched by all these little free pantries. Beyond the signs of wonders, the trust of those who have not seen. I think that even what Jesus is missing here, when people are asking to touch him, though, is that his friends were still grieving, right? Thomas was still grieving him. And the touch was not just that he had risen, but it was to just touch him one more time. And I don't know about y'all, but when my friend passed away, I just wanted to be there with her one more time, to have one more conversation with her, to hold her hand one more time, to lay my head on her lap one more time, like the day I left to go to grad school because I missed her so, so dearly. And the loss and the trauma of watching their beloved brother die on that cross, the witness of that, they just wanted to touch him one more time. But if we wait a moment, amidst all of that grief and loss, Jesus had bigger dreams. John is the gospel that says, you will do greater things than I. And that's the one thing in the Bible that my grandmother was like, no, no, I can't do, I can't do bigger things than Jesus. And my friend Doug Padgett wrote a book on how we're called to do, in fact, greater things than Jesus. But God has bigger hopes for us than we can possibly imagine. Sometimes reconciliation is delayed. Sometimes it comes after deep heartache, after 40 days of Lent, 40 years in the wilderness. Death is jarring, even regular death, right? And the crucifixion was no regular death. It was violent. It was heart-wrenching. Some of us have experienced that kind of death. Deaths like that. If you all close your eyes, some of you have experienced that kind of death. I saw a meme this week about three second graders arriving at the pearly gates. They experienced death like that. And we go so fast through the passion because we want to get to Easter. We want to get to the hope and even Jesus seemed to want to move to the celebration and the peace and the meal. He said, do you have any food to eat when he came to the upper room, right? Do you have any fish? You know, feel my wounds. Let's celebrate. But friends, God gives us time to grieve, shed the tears, and then then and only then celebrate the resurrection. Take time to process. God is gracious. There's no clock to punch. 
There's no linear timeline for God. What I know for sure is that watching death should be painful, and we should allow ourselves to bear witness, like Thomas, like Mary, and that peace can be with us alongside of the grief, and that we will share that meal regardless, whether it's a funeral meal or whether it's a resurrection meal. Jesus is the peace that withstands all of that. Amen. Mm -hmm.